introduction to hell. Uh, sorry for the delayed opening here. Um, I am just going to go ahead right in. I'm again John Schreiber from Children's National Medical Center. Uh, I'm going to talk tonight about epilepsy and seizures in Mollett Wilson syndrome. Um, so we'll discuss seizures in general and epilepsy terminology. We'll talk specifically about seizures and epilepsy and Mollett Wilson syndrome discuss what type of evaluation we do for seizures, and then go into seizure management a bit, talk about some medications, things that have been useful, particularly for Moet wilson syndrome, and then other alternative options, and some newer medications, newer therapies. We'll also discuss comorbidities and complications associated with epilepsy, and some of the neurological issues you can see in Moet wilson syndrome. So a seizure is defined as a disturbance in the electrical activity of the brain with some sort of associated clinical change. So usually, usually you'll see a, a shaking, some kind of motor manifestation to a seizure. Um, but sometimes people can just experience a sensation, a, a feeling. Uh, epilepsy is defined as two or more unprovoked seizures separated by more than 24 hours. And I'll get into what that means a bit more uh, later on. Um, that is the accepted definition of epilepsy. There is now uh, a, a newer definition of epilepsy that becomes important for people with Mellon Wilson syndrome and other similar kinds of, of syndromes where you do have a high risk of seizures, where you have one seizure and your risk of having a second seizure is greater than 60%. Uh, and that's important because usually when we diagnose someone with epilepsy, we are typically intending to treat that person. So overall, just to kind of go over the overall epidemiology of epilepsy, it affects more than 2 million people in the U.S. Uh, we find 150,000 new cases of epilepsy in the U.S. annually. And overall, one in 26 people in the U.S. will, be, will develop epilepsy at some point in their lifetime. So it's a pretty, it's a fairly common disease. If you look at overall um, neurological diseases, you, you'll see here it's number four, the fourth most prevalent neurological problem uh, in people in the U.S. Uh, behind migraine, stroke, and Alzheimer's. But it affects people over a long period of their lifespan. If you look at overall rates of new cases of epilepsy, you see peaks in childhood and peaks in, in later adulthood. Just to get going to some of the seizure basics so you um, have some background for, for discussing this. Um, seizures are classified by their, their onset. So there are seizures that can start focally, with all those focal onset seizures. Uh, there are generalized onset seizures and those with unknown onset. So within focal onset seizures, uh, we distinguish those that are uh, that impair your awareness and those that don't impair your awareness. And there's a variety of different seizure types that you can see within focal seizures. We used to call these complex partial seizures, those that impair your awareness. But classically, these are seizures where um, someone will just lose contact with what's going on around them. Um, and then they might have other abnormal movements, other abnormal sensations or things they can experience. And they can last a few seconds to, to several minutes and sometimes longer. Uh, the generalized onset seizures, I think the ones that people are most familiar with are tonic clonic seizures. Uh, those are also called grand mal seizures. But there's other types too. So, so absent seizures are uh, particularly relevant for, for Moet Wilson syndrome. It's one of the more common seizure types seen in Mollett Wilson syndrome, and um, they're, they're also a type of generalized seizure. And the distinction is important because we use different medications to treat focal seizures versus generalized seizures. So once you've determined someone's seizure type, you can go into the epilepsy type and then see if you can fit someone into a particular epilepsy syndrome. And again, this can kind of help you to guide, guide treatment. Not as relevant for Mohan Wilson syndrome. Uh, the evaluation we, we typically do 
can include labs. In some cases, it depends if there's anything else going on that might explain a seizure. If someone has uh, a kidney disease in the very young, this can be useful. Those that are under a year old, we, we're more, more likely to see things like low glucose or um, low calcium that can provoke a seizure. But more commonly, we're, we're typically just getting neuroimaging and really MRI brain is preferred if you, you can. And electroencephalogram or EEG. Now, we, there's different types of electroencephalogram and, and mostly they just kind of depend on the, the length. So what we usually do is what's called a routine EEG. And a routine EEG is anywhere from 20 to 60 minutes in general and just gives you an idea of what the brain is doing at one point in time. So it shows you someone's overall brain activity. You can get an assessment if the, if the brain activity looks too slow for age, and that can, be, that can be associated with people who have developmental delay, developmental problems, are, are more likely to have slowing on their, on their EEG. I can also show us if there's um, spike waves, spikes, things that are associated with seizures, we call that epileptiform activity. And if we see something like that, that can indicate to us that someone is at higher risk to have recurrent seizures. In general, if you have someone who has a, a new onset, their first seizure, uh, their chance of having more, this is for anyone in general, is about 30, 40%. If you have an abnormal epileptiform EEG, meaning with spikes, spike wave activity, that, that risk goes up to about 60%. And then continuous EEG is where you place an EEG and you keep it on for a while. And sometimes we can do it for several days. And usually our intent there is to record episodes we think might be seizures, um, or in, in, in some cases, look at sleep. So this is important for Wilson syndrome, since we know that this electrographic status epileptic sleep can occur. And you sometimes can only see this on a continuous overnight EEG. I'll talk briefly about febrile seizures. So febrile seizures are considered a provoked seizure. And when we think about epilepsy, we don't necessarily consider febrile seizures in that epilepsy diagnosis. Uh, so febrile seizures occur in about one in 20 children overall. This is for all neurotypical children, between six months and six years old. The peak age for febrile seizures is actually about two and a half years old. And again, we distinguish simple febrile seizures versus complex febrile seizures. The complex features are all there. So if you have a long febrile seizure, if you have just jerking in one part of your body, or if you have two or more in 24 hours, that's a bit unusual. So you, you might do more if that happens. And, and some, some of your children may have started with a febrile seizure. It's something that's known to happen in, in Moe Wilson syndrome. Um, and there, there might be some out there where that sort of led to the diagnosis. Uh, we don't always get an EEG or do more workup for simple febrile seizures, but usually if there's something else going on, something a little more complex, we will delve, delve deeper. Treatment for, for febrile seizures, we know that um, antipyretics, so medications like ibuprofen or Tylenol that lower your temperature, they don't decrease risk for febrile seizures with future illnesses. But actually within that same illness, so if, you get, if your child gets a cold, they have a febrile seizure, if you use Tylenol or ibuprofen Advil, um, one of those medications during that illness, that can reduce the chance having febrile seizures during that illness. So there, there, there probably is some place for doing it. To my patients, I recommend, uh, if, if the temperature's high enough, if it goes above 101, 102, I, you know, would be giving uh, medication to lower the temperature also just because of your... your but if a child then has a febrile seizure, uh, it's not that you just missed giving a dose of this. It's not your fault that it happens. It either happens or it doesn't. That usually can't hurt to try. Um, overall, about a third will have recurrent febrile seizures. 10% have three or more. And uh, if you have multiple abnormal 
features with those febrile seizures, your risk for developing epilepsy long term is is higher. I'll skip through some of this, but there's there's different features that can give you a higher risk for epilepsy after a febrile seizure. Um, uh, abnormal development is one of those. Uh, positive family history, Moet Wilson syndrome would also increase your risk of, of developing epilepsy. So specifically talking about Moet Wilson syndrome, we know that seizures happen in a, about three quarters, so fairly common. And seizures do not appear to correlate with brain malformation. So you do an MRI and the extent of, of abnormality on that imaging doesn't really predict who's going to have seizures, who's going to have seizures that are difficult to control. There's, there's, there's something else going on here. So a good study from 2013 um, really looked at epilepsy and seizure characteristics in Moen Wilson syndrome. And this study just to, kind of goes into the weeds a bit here, but I think it's really useful. Uh, examined 22 patients that had different kinds of mutations and deletions. The seizure onset, the average was about 15 months. And the range is pretty big, so 1 to 108 months. And most of them had their first seizure triggered by a fever. So that's why I talked some about febrile seizures. Um, they most often, the most often seizure type was focal seizures that could generalize or not. And when you have a focal seizure that generalizes, it'll start focally and then will then usually turn into a grand mal seizure. And that those happen early on. And atypical absent seizures happen later. Those absent seizures are the ones that just look like staring. There's really not any other change you see necessarily than staring. It just interrupts activity and um, you cannot bring someone out of. And that, that's an important point here, talking about seizure recognition. You have to realize that every kid stares. Um, we all stare. It's when you have staring that interrupts activity. So in the middle of doing something and all of a sudden you just stop, that could be a seizure. And the other point is that you cannot bring someone out of a seizure. So if you are able to tickle your child and they respond to you, that's it's unlikely that what you just saw was a seizure unless it just happened to stop at that exact same time. But absent seizures, if you have ep if you, your child's having episodes where they stare, and particularly those that interrupt their activity, and where you cannot interrupt them with you know tickling or some kind of physical stimulation, those can be absent seizures. Again, usually later on. The initial EEG in Mo Wilson syndrome is typically normal, or you might have some of that mild background slowing I talked about when some can have spikes, so some can have that, that epileptiform activity. And that EEG evolves, so usually between about four and six years old, you see the development of these this high amplitude spike wave discharges, and, and many can have this continuous or nearly continuous spike wave during sleep, a finding that we call electrographic status epilepticus of sleep, or ESES. -E we'll go into that again in a minute. This is from the same paper. I think some points here are important to illustrate and highlight. Um, so each patient is listed here according to their age at the most recent visit. So this, on this particular part of the table, it ranged from two years to 10 years old. This goes over, you can see my mouse, uh, the age of onset of non-febrile seizures. So these are your unprovoked seizures when those start. And the, the age range varies. Again, the average age is as about 15 months. And most of those people have focal seizures. FS is focal seizures. And a, AA is absence seizures. Myoclonic seizures are just uh, usually irregular, repetitive jerking movements. Um, and this talks some more about exactly what those seizures can look like, often during sleep. Uh, and this is medications that were most useful these patients here, SF means seizure-free, 
and um, sometimes you can be seizure-free for your focal seizures, whereas the absent seizures might persist. But you can see that the medicines used most frequently, especially when you see seizure freedom, fr from this look like valproic acid. So valproic acid is also called Depakote. But there's others that may also be affected. So phenobarbital, uh, which is usually isn't our first choice is because it is so sedating, can sometimes affect IQ and, and cognitive development. Uh, carbamazepine, oxycarbazepine, levetiracetam is also one that's used a lot, uh, and that can be useful. Um, go on to the next slide here. This is the remainder of the patients from that study. And again, you see them all the way up to age 22 years old. Um, so you do have those in this older age group that can be seizure-free, often maintained on medications. But you have, you have others that, that continue to have seizures. Again, what you see a lot of alproic acid, you see some levetiracetam, and then a variety of other medications being used. They're all listed down here. This is the EEG um, in a patient who is um, nine years old and 11 years old. And what you'll see here is the EEG during an absence seizure. So you see a lot of this abnormal activity, which is all over the brain. And this corresponds with uh, a, a staring spell where the child's unresponsive. Same with the, the bottom figure here, also associated uh, with an absence seizure. That's what we see on the EEG. Uh, more recent studies came out last year, which used the um, patient registry data. Um, so uh, very important to, to be involved in that if you can. It really helps us to understand a lot about uh, what, what happens in Moet Wilson syndrome. And um, this, this was a great, a great paper. I'm just focusing here on the, the neurological points. Um, but it was very exhaustive, so that's something to look into if you haven't had a chance. Um, this included 87 patients with Miller Wilson syndrome. 84% had seizures. The average age was a bit older, so they were around a little over two years old. Again, a lot had seizures triggered by fever, mostly focal seizures some generalized and some focal with secondary generalization. So it's again, started focally and turned into a grand mal seizure. And about a quarter were resistant to anti-seizure medications, but three quarters did, did respond to anti-seizure medications. If you look at the, the graphs here in the bottom, and this just goes over the, the, the overall incidence of what you see neurologically, um, hypotonia, was very common, so just low tone overall, which is usually associated with, with motor impairment and weakness. And then epilepsy was really the most common feature with different kinds of seizures within that. This uh, second graph goes over the uh, average age of, the, of developmental milestones when these things were achieved. So um, kids sat a little before 20 months old walked between 40 and 50 months, and we're talking between 50 and 60 months. So as I mentioned before, it's not just the, the um, abnormal brain, it's not just the abnormal uh, cortex or some what we call the malformations of cortical development that cause seizures. There's other things going on since that doesn't, those changes don't correlate with seizure incidents, they don't correlate with seizure severity. Um, so this gene, ZEB2, is a DNA binding transcriptional repressor. What it does is it is important for how these neural progenitor cells, these baby neurons, differentiate into different types of neurons. So what you end up with is less neurons that uh, produce this inhibitory neurotransmitter called GABA. And GABA is really important for overall inhibition in the brain. And as you can imagine, GABA is also very important in suppressing and stopping seizures. 
there's probably several other mechanisms at play as, as well, but that is one of the, the, the big um, features here. And, and valproic acid, one of the main ways that valproic acid actually acts is by potentiating GABA, by helping to improve that, that, in, that inhibitory response in the brain. This is uh, a few more EEGs. This is from uh, a patient with an atypical absence seizure on the left here in box A, you see an absence seizure, again, associated with staring. This is in the awake state. And then when the child falls asleep, this is this pattern of electrographic status epilepticus of sleep. This abnormal spike wave activity in this particular child is going on all the time. Now, this is one case that was um, treated with hydrocortisone, it's a, a steroid. And you can see here that um, the that abnormal activity is, is markedly reduced and you, we're seeing now more normal sleep patterns during sleep as well. Uh, I'll, we can talk some about ESES or electrographic status epilepticus of sleep, but I do think that's one area that's worth exploring more in Mowat-Wilson syndrome to get a better idea of the overall uh, occurrence of this, when it happens, how it happens, and then how it responds to treatment, because it's not really well known. Uh, the overall, the, overall, the treatment of electrographic status epilepticus of sleep, when it occurs in association with a regression, a child who loses skills, we, um, we have a term for that when it's a loss of speech. We call it an acquired epileptic aphasia. And Landau-Kleffner syndrome is a type of that. And there's many different treatments for Landau-Kleffner syndrome or acquired epileptic aphasia. One of our typical treatments for it is, is steroids, but there's many other things to consider. Um, I, I think that would be a, a really important area to explore probably going forward, but just not something we really can um, say much more about at this time. As far as seizure treatment, um, we tend to start medications that have the fewest side effects. If you look at the number of medicines that have been developed over the years, in general, the, the new medicines have not been proven to be more effective necessarily than the older medications. But what we do find is that they, they, they tend to be a little better tolerated in regards to their side effect profile. So we tend to choose medications that have the fewest side effects first and then change things as needed. What our, our adage in epilepsy treatment is to use the lowest number of medications at the lowest dose that adequately treats seizures uh, and try to have no side effects and no seizures is our, is our ultimate goal. Obviously that's not always possible. So uh, keeping those things in mind, we still try to have people on the fewest medications we can at the lowest doses, limiting side effects while reducing seizures um, as much as possible. Uh, when we do start a seizure medication, we start at a low dose. We usually titrate up to a dose we think may be effective, a, a therapeutic dose. And then if someone continues having seizures at that point, we will then continue increasing that medication, usually, if we think it's effective and if it's not seeming to cause untoward side effects. If we do reach that point where the medication looks like it's no longer going to be effective, more increases aren't gonna help, or if someone is experiencing significant side effects, then we change to something else. And usually how we change to something else is by adding a new medicine and then ideally reducing that, that first medication. Um, Goals of treatment can vary. You know, like, like I said, we try to, we want to make everyone seizure free if possible. In some people who have, have uh, not responded adequately to a couple different medications, that's not always possible. Um, so we have, we, it's, it's important to talk with your physician about what the goals for seizure treatment are. Um, generally, it's, it's important to try to control seizures, especially to the extent that you're not having seizures that are making you very uh, unsafe or high risk seizures. So grand mal seizures are high risk. Um, if you're having seizures so frequently that it's, it's interfering with your life, that's 
obviously very important too. So we want to reduce seizures as much as possible while trying to limit side effects of these medications. Um, it's important to have a seizure action plan to know what to do when a seizure occurs. It's important for you know use parents and also uh, and and caregivers and for um, schools as well to have a seizure action plan so they know what to do when a seizure occurs. And then stopping medications. When we do stop medications. We usually taper them. We reduce them slowly over time. This graph just goes over the uh, seizure medications that have been approved according to year. Um, you see that the number of anti-seizure medications has really just uh, been proliferating since the 1980s um, and continues to grow. And now we have medicines that are being tailored to specific types of neurotransmitter systems and new medications that, that act on totally different pathways. And I'll talk about one that's not on here. I think I had some questions about cannabidiol. I had included some uh, slides on that, anticipating some questions on cannabidiol. So we'll go into that in a few minutes. We also had a question about VNS or vagal nerve stimulator for epilepsy. Um, this is just a, a illustration of the a VNS device. So a VNS is a vagal nerve stimulator. There is a generator that's implanted under the um, uh, chest wall here usually on the left side, and a wire that runs and wraps around the vagus nerve. It is set to stimulate. Uh, it'll be on for the usual starting settings are on for 30 seconds and off for five minutes, and it delivers a, a certain um, amplitude stimulation at a set time throughout the day and night. Uh, there are newer devices now, deep brain stimulation, um, which might potentially be useful in uh, different kinds of genetic epilepsies, including Mowat-Wilson syndrome. But for now, it's just FDA approved for adults with intractable epilepsy. And then responsive neurostimulation, which is, is really more appropriate for people with, with focal epilepsy that's coming from one or a couple different spots in the brain, where you can actually put electrodes into the brain or on the surface of the brain that then detects those seizures and, and interrupts them. Probably not as uh, pertinent for Mowat-Wilson syndrome, but these two, VNS certainly can be, and deep brain stimulation may have a place at some point. There's also dietary therapies. So the ketogenic diet is, is the best known. Um, there's MCT oil diet, low glycemic index diet, and modified Atkins diet. And if this is something that you're, you're interested in pursuing, I, I, I encourage people to consider it for uh, seizures and epilepsy that is intractable to medication, so not responding adequately to usually a, a, at least a couple different medications. Dietary therapies can be a good option. And if you want to consider it, uh, I, I'd encourage you to seek out a, a, a dietary therapies program in epilepsy. We, we have a great one at, at Children's National. Um, our ketogenic diet program is, is uh, really top notch and um, can help a lot of folks who have intractable seizures. Okay, on to cannabis. Um, so uh, cannabis is um, comprise of two neuroactive components, uh, THC and cannabidiol. Uh, they're here, their chemical formula is below. Um, THC is the psychoactive cannabinoid in cannabis, um, and cannabidiol does not have those same psychoactive properties, so it does not get you high. Uh, there, uh, before I go into this, there, there is what's called artisanal cannabis. So artisanal cannabis is um, uh, cannabidiol that is, sorry, artisanal cannabidiol is cannabidiol derived, it's all derived from the plant. The, the pharmaceutical cannabidiol is also derived from the plant. Um, and, but the artisanal forms, there's a variety of different kinds that are out there. There's uh, several different companies that actually manufacture this. And, and sell this um, online. Um, you can go down to your local 
um, drugstore or, or dispensary and find this too. Uh, there is, there's varying degrees of quality control and varying amounts of cannabidiol in those compounds. So if, if that's something that you are interested in pursuing, um, we can talk about why you might do that or why, why you might not do that. But I'd encourage you to talk with your neurologist, um, talk with your, your other providers, and, and see if you can get any more insights into if this is something that might be appropriate for your child or not. But I would just, just be sure to use caution uh, if you are seeking out this artisanal cannabidiol, just knowing that there can be uh, uh, different things in that. These uh, can contain some amounts of THC, and THC can have some pro-convulsant, so pro-seizure properties, uh, and, and they can contain different amounts of cannabidiol. In general, what I've found is the amounts of cannabidiol in the artisanal cannabidiol is much less than in the, in the pharmaceutical cannabidiol. So I'll, I'll go into that right now because we have um, some clinical trials, and now cannabidiol is approved uh, as a medication we can prescribe. And it's based on this, this research here. So this is this slide didn't go through that well. It's a bit blurry. Um, but there was an open-label cannabidiol trial um, for this pharmaceutical cannabidiol. Uh, it included 137 patients in their analysis on if it was effective or not. And they had different kinds of epilepsies, most commonly Dravet syndrome and, and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. And those are two... Um, somewhat specific kinds of epilepsy. Dravet syndrome is due to mutations in a gene called SCN1A, uh, whereas Lennox-Gastaut syndrome is it's a syndrome. There's multiple different kinds of, of things that can lead to it, um, some, some genetic, some structural, some brain injury. Uh, and based on this and additional studies, cannabidiol is now FDA approved. But if you look at the overall efficacy, so how, how effective is cannabidiol for motor seizures, so seizures with some kind of convulsing or shaking. Most patients did have a reduction in their monthly seizure frequency. Not, not all did. Some did have an increase in seizure frequency. But more often than not, you had a reduction in your monthly motor seizures um, during that treatment period. Uh, these are the two pivotal trials um, on which this FDA approval was based. Uh, for Gervais syndrome and lennox gastaut syndrome. Uh, these are patients who had failed multiple different anti-seizure medications. For the, the lennox gastaut syndrome trial, they had failed an average of, of six medications. Uh, about half were also administered clobazam or Onfi at the same time, in addition to the other uh, anti-seizure medications. And I'm just focusing here on lennox gastaut syndrome. So this is the, the, the definition of lennox gastaut syndrome is multiple different types of generalized seizures and a particular EEG abnormality, not usually something you would see in Mullet Wilson syndrome, um, but probably a bit more applicable than uh, Gervais syndrome would be to this Mullet Wilson syndrome population. Um, if you look at the results of this study, there were 225 patients who had LGS, Lennox Gastaut syndrome, and they received uh, different doses of cannabidiol. This comes as, as, as a liquid. And you can see here at the 10 milligram per kilogram dose and the 20 milligram per kilogram dose, the total seizures dropped by more than a third, whereas the decrease in placebo was much smaller. And this was a significant difference. Uh, it's not without side effects. So the common side effects are sleepiness, fever, diarrhea, and actually decreased appetite. You don't see, you think you'd see increased appetite with a a cannabis derived product, but this actually causes decreased appetite. And it's probably because it acts on different receptors than TAC does. Uh, other uh, common side effects, but less common were fatigue, cold symptoms, lack of energy, irritability, change in liver enzymes, sometimes an increase in seizures, weight loss. There's several others that you can look at there. One important thing to note is it, it does interact with some other drugs, so it actually increases levels of clobazam and clobazam's active metabolite. So if you're on clobazam, it's an important thing to note that if uh, you're also taking cannabidiol, you may want to uh, monitor clobazam levels. Uh, 
And if someone is overly tired, think about lowering that clopazam dose. There was no effect on the valproic acid level. Um, it may change metabolism with some other drugs. So I, I, I would just encourage you to uh, consider having other medication levels checked if your child is using cannabidiol. Um, other seizure management issues that are important, um, I uh, talk with all par parents and caregivers about seizure precautions, so what to do um, uh, differently. Namely, it's, it's avoiding water, avoiding being in water uh, uh, by themselves. Um, the bath is the big one, so you never leave the child in the bathtub by themselves uh, just for risk of drowning. Um, what to do when a seizure occurs. We can get into this some. Avoiding triggers, so sleep deprivation is a big one. Um, medications, the sedating antihistamines like Benadryl can sometimes uh, increase a chance of seizure. Uh, that's something you have to weigh risk and benefit if you're using Benadryl for, um, you know, for allergies or something else like that. Sometimes it can be important to use, but if there's alternatives like non-sedating antihistamines like um, loratadine, uh, some others like that, that those, those might be preferred. Mismedications can trigger seizures. Uh, and then we'll talk some about uh, seizure detection and monitoring. We have some questions about that as well. So this is a seizure action plan by the Epilepsy Foundation. Uh, at the top, you see, uh, you can fill out um, the uh, child's name and go through all the seizure types. This is good to give to the, the school. And talk about <clears throat> what to do when a seizure occurs, basic seizure first aid. Does, this, does the child have to leave the classroom after a seizure occurs? When to call 911, uh, and it just has some general basic seizure first aid, and when a seizure is generally considered an emergency, which is true for most people. There's a place down here at the bottom if uh, a child has a seizure uh, rescue medication, you can put that there. Status epilepticus is a prolonged seizure. So we really are now defining status epilepticus as a seizure lasting more than five minutes. But um, you'll see some places that define it as more than a half an hour. And that's because a seizure that lasts more than a half an hour we know can cause problems. So it can cause problems with uh, the circulatory system, with, with breathing, with, uh, can sometimes cause uh, scarring in the brain if it lasts for more than a half an hour. And that's, this, this is a grand, a grand mal seizure. It lasts more than a half an hour. Um, but we, we lowered the time down to five minutes because we know that a seizure that lasts more than five minutes is more likely to continue unless we intervene. It's not that anything bad happens at five minutes. It's just that it's more likely to go on unless you give a medication to make it stop at that point. So particularly this is something that your, your child has, has experienced, a prolonged seizure. It's important to know, know what to do when it happens again and uh, to have a medication on hand to use in case that should happen. Uh, this uh, graph here just goes through what can happen with a prolonged seizure. So you have changes in your, um, your, your uh, cardiorespiratory system. You have decreased blood flow, decreased glucose and oxygen. Uh, that happens after a half an hour. So important to have a, a, a plan in place should a prolonged seizure occur. I should note that from what I've seen, uh, status epilepticus is not a very common occurrence in Mullet Wilson syndrome. Uh, although I, I am not sure if there is other evidence from the registry uh, that would um, that, that would go against that. I think that's one important thing that we could look at. Uh, I talked some about avoiding uh, injury, okay, uh, particularly drowning. Uh, aspiration or aspiration pneumonia is um, one of the most common causes of, of death, one of the most common causes of injury uh, in uh, people with neurodevelopmental disabilities and epilepsy. There's something called SUDEP or sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. And in kids, the, the overall uh, incidence, how often it happens, is about one in one in a thousand to one in 4,500 per year. That's children with epilepsy. Those who have neurodevelopmental disability uh, 
have a bit of a higher risk, um, and we don't know what causes it yet. So there's uh, so some of the research that I do is going into looking at the potential causes of, of SUDEP. Uh, there's probably some genetic factors. There might be cardiac factors, and then how the brain responds after a seizure. Uh, but we know the things that can reduce the risk of SUDEP are taking medications, trying to reduce the number of grand mal seizures someone has, and then monitoring. So we'll get into monitoring in a few minutes. Then there's psychiatric, cognitive, and behavioral side effects of seizures, which we could talk about for hours probably. I won't go into that too much. Um, but these can accompany seizures in a, in a neurotypical child. Uh, I include this at the very end here, um, just because it's important to vaccinate children, um, even those with epilepsy. Uh, if you look at overall chance of seizures um, in, this is in uh, neurotypical, any, any child, there is no increased risk in the first year uh, associated with vaccination of a seizure occurrence. But if you actually wait to, to vaccinate, you can have fever associated seizures occurring more commonly with delayed vaccination. That's probably because we know kids are at a higher risk to have febrile seizures at six months to six years with a peak incidence around two or two and a half years old. So I, I would advocate for a normal vaccination schedule for that reason. This is from the uh, Italian League Against Epilepsy. Uh, recommendations is that vaccination should be performed without contraindication in children with epilepsy, um, but probably wait. Uh, this is also true for children with um, other epileptic encephalopathies. Uh, I, I would say if someone has uncontrolled seizures at the moment, you might want to wait until they're under a little better control, but I wouldn't wait too long because we know that illness can also increase risk of seizures. All right, so that, that concludes this uh, talk here. I'm going to uh, discuss a couple of questions here at the end, um, but we went over seizure and epilepsy terminology, seizures and epilepsy and motor Wilson syndrome, what we do for seizure evaluation, how we manage seizures, and then some complications and comorbidities we see in association with seizures. So let me look for these questions here quickly. One of the first questions I, I recall was about monitoring. And that's one thing I, that I wanted to get into, what monitoring devices are out there, what things can detect seizures. Um, that's a bit of a tough question. So there are several devices out there that can detect convulsive or shaking seizures. There are, um, most recently there was a, a, there's a watch, um, Embrace, that's FDA approved, um, that is, is good for picking up uh, grand mal or convulsive seizures. And it really, in part, is exploiting that shaking that happens during a seizure. Although it also detects heart rate, it detects changes in uh, the sweat, essentially, um, that uh, it also uses to, to pick up the seizure. And they can send you an alert. So that's FDA approved for six and above for seizure detection if you have those, those shaking, those grand mal seizures in, in particular. Um, and there's another watch out there, another device, I think called Smart Monitor. Um, there's, uh, there's mattress. Um, there's uh, detectors that can be put in a mattress that, again, detect shaking. There are uh, video monitors that can look for those abnormal movements. Um, so a number of devices out there that really are exploiting motion or movement. Um, I also, if, if nothing else, I think it's useful just to have a, a video and audio monitor um, in, the, in the child's room so you can see them, you can hear them if they have a seizure. It doesn't help, though, kids who have very subtle focal seizures, it, it is often hard to detect those. And there's not really any great devices out there right now for detecting those kinds of seizures. But some of these things that I've mentioned might potentially be useful. I think some people also will do pulse ox monitoring if they drop oxygen saturations with seizures, but that can also give you a lot of, a lot of false positives. Um, 
So what I recommend is either you know trying one of those devices or using a video and audio baby monitor so you can keep an eye on someone while they're sleeping. Um, I have another question here about a child who's waking up in the middle of the night, angry, inconsolable, and slightly aggressive. It can last around 20 minutes. Asking if this is something we could see if this child were post-ictal. So post-ictal means it's, your, it's the effects after a seizure. We call that the post-ictal period. Um, so that is a possibility. You can see a change in behavior after a seizure. But usually if you're gonna have that significant of a post-ictal period, you will often have uh, some kind of noticeable seizure occurring before that. And again, I, I touched on seizure recognition some, but seizures tend to be rather stereotyped. They look similar every time, not similar among different children, but similar within that child. They tend to look the same seizure to seizure, or at least similar. Uh, and you should not be able to interrupt them. That can sometimes help you distinguish things. But ultimately, particularly if they're occurring frequently enough, video EEG, a continuous video EEG, may be the way to go to really distinguish what's abnormal behavior and what's a seizure. Uh, I have a question about, um, let's see, whether seizure-like activity should be medicated. I think that gets the, the basic premise of the other question again, is that if we're seeing something that looks like a seizure, uh, should we use medication or how do we diagnose that? I think if something is pretty clearly a seizure and you have to discuss this with your, with your neurologist, with, with, with the clinician, if something's pretty clearly a seizure, then it makes sense to just treat it. You don't have to necessarily record a seizure on an EEG to confirm it if it really sounds like a seizure. And then you, you start a medication, you monitor response to medication. If someone isn't responding to medication, then you might need to reconsider that action and say, hey, let's go back and take a look at this and see what this presumed seizure looks like on an EEG. Uh, how often should, we, should an EEG be done? There's no specific timing for getting an EEG. You don't have to get one every year or every, you know, every six months um, in, in general. Uh, you do an EEG when there is a reason to do so. So if you have a new onset seizure, that, that's a reason to get an EEG. If you're considering changing medication, sometimes that can be a, a good reason to get an EEG. Uh, if you see regression, loss of skills, that's a reason maybe to look for uh, ESES, that electrographic status epilepticus of sleep. If you're seeing sleep disturbance, there's you know, something you, you're looking for. That's a reason to do the EEG, but no specific time at which I would get an EEG necessarily. Um, when to cut back on medications. Uh, we talked some about what medications seem to be the most beneficial. Um, there we, you know, we know there are patients, there are people who can be seizure free. Uh, it, I, I would wait, I'd wait a while. It's hard for me to say exactly how long to wait, uh, but I would wait longer uh, before tapering someone completely off medications. Uh, then I would wait in a neurotypical child, if that makes sense. I hope that helps. Um, let's see. Um, how often to check medication levels? It depends on the, the medication. So certain medications you do typically follow levels. So valproic acid is a good example of one where you follow levels. Carbamazepine, you often follow levels. Uh, some of the new ones like levetiracetam, topiramate, um, even the, the newer medications, we often won't follow a medication level. Uh, let's see, is there a way to tell if a seizure is coming either days before or just before? Not typically. Um, some parents do tell me they notice a change in their child's behavior uh, a couple of days before a seizure occurs, um, but that's not something that, that I really can talk about in general. If you find that your child does something a day or two before every seizure, then I, I certainly would pay attention to that because I, I, I would uh, I wager to say that you probably do know best. Um, let's see. 
question about looking into ESES, that electrographic status, epileptic of sleep and Noah Wilson syndrome. Um, it usually occurs between, starts between four and six years old. For most ESES, most kids outgrow it by 10 years old. I'm not sure exactly how long it takes for Moet Wilson syndrome, but I would I would presume that it's around that time, whereas the kids go through through puberty. I'm getting a question here. How do you know which medication is best for Moet Wilson syndrome seizures? We have some experience from what was reported there in, in some of the scientific papers I talked about uh, that valproic acid, levetiracetam, uh, are are good medications oftentimes from Wilson syndrome, but not for everyone. You know, they, these medications have side effects. We're often guided by their side effect profile. I would advocate using broad spectrum seizure medications. So those that act on lots of different seizure types from Wilson syndrome um, and just be guided by seizure type. And focal seizures can also respond to medications like, like oxcarbazepine, carbamazepine. I don't think there's any one right medication for Moet Wilson syndrome. Um, any information about whether teens with Moet Wilson syndrome outgrow ESES? Um, can they outgrow seizures? That's something I think the registry will hopefully help us with more and really delving into that will hopefully help us to better understand that. Um, but most children do, children do outgrow ESES. I think the question for me is when they do, and if we can, uh, if doing something to make that go away can somehow help a child's development, and I don't think I know the answer to that. I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. Um, let's see. Uh, VNS, I have a question about VNS. So I think VNS actually is a good option for some people with intractable seizures, um, especially when there is uh, a, a genetic syndrome like like Moet Wilson syndrome that's uh, the cause. So I, I do think that is a reasonable option. That's something I would if if, if your uh, child has has failed to respond adequately to two or more medications. I think VNS and other kinds of therapies like that can be considered, in, in, including dietary therapies, so ketogenic diet and other things. Um, there is someone with uh, myoclonic seizures. And so, so myoclonic seizures are these repetitive, uh, often kind of erratic or irregular jerking episodes that occur back to back usually. Um, could coming off medication be a possibility? Um, I, I think coming off medication certainly is a possibility for this. I, it's hard to say exactly how often, but I would, our normal the normal way that we act um, is to consider uh, lowering a seizure medication when someone's been seizure free for two years, because in, your, in a typical child, your uh, chance of coming off medication successfully is about 60% if you've been seizure free for two years or more. Um, but that's, that is not going to be the case in Moet Wilson syndrome. Uh, I would wait longer um, until someone's seizure-free for a longer period of time before thinking about tapering medications. I had a question about behavior and whether change in behavior could be absence seizures. Um, usually, absence seizures are not, uh, they just result in staring. Um, they do not usually produce a change in behavior during the seizure. They could potentially after the seizure if they have some post ictal period associated with that. The focal seizure could do that too. So if you're seeing uh, discrete changes in behavior, so particularly if it's like a, a short period of time if, and if it's not provoked. So again, seizures are not usually provoked, uh, whereas behavior often is. And if you're seeing totally unexplained, unprovoked, discrete episodes of change in behavior, particularly if you can't interrupt them. And it's possible that that could be a seizure. So I think I've got through all the questions, um, at least the ones I saw. I hope I caught everyone. <laughs>
if you have uh, more questions, um, please send them to Al. Uh, I'd be, you know, be happy to respond to people. Um, uh, we, uh, we have a really robust epilepsy and epilepsy genetics program at Children's National. We're uh, you know, be happy to, um, to answer any more questions people have and for Moet-Wilson syndrome.